That is the Basin and Range National Monument. And this shows within Lincoln County who uh, manages or owns the land. The green is the Fish and Wildlife Service with the Desert Refuge and the Paranagate National Wildlife Refuge. The left uh, um, pink stuff here is the DOD, the Nellis Testing and Training Range. And all the yellow is BLM. All the white is privately owned. Not much white there. 93% of it, of this other, other than the testing range and the, and the, uh, the refuges are BLM managed lands. And so the first question would be, when do humans first enter the new world? Yes, we're gonna go back that far because we need to talk about it for Lincoln County. So I'd like to start off with this, a map of the world. And this is what it looked like when I went to school. Uh, it shows here that the first humans crossed Beringia about 15,000 years ago and entered into North America and the United States area about 12,000 years ago. And I'll just add here that about 50,000 years ago, humans arrived in Australia and about 30,000 years ago into the islands east of New Guinea. That's what it looked like when I went to school. But since that time, oh, I want to add also that um, it shows these two ice sheets. And many archaeologists believed that folks immigrated through this corridor between the Cordillian and the Laurentide ice sheets. And then they made their way down to the United States area. That seems kind of far-fetched, but that's, that's what they say. But you'll also notice that on the coasts here, we have uh, a, th this area here was a, on land and also here to the west, this was all land. And now since the ice sheets have melted and the poles have melted, the extra water there covers up a lot of the area that surely there are artifacts of early humans coming into North America. Well, a little bit further on, we found out, oh, well, maybe if it was 12,000 years ago, what are these dates from earlier folks all the way down to South America and Monte Verde? 14,500 years ago. And look, here's some early dates over on the, on the East Coast in the Gulf of Mexico. These dates too don't jive with that original picture. And now we have even more and more earlier dates. They're coming up to, and to explain it, they're saying it, the ocean currents were turning clockwise and people were coming over from Russia and um, Siberia along the coast. And also some other folks, particularly um, um, Tom Dillahay, who did some work down in uh, Monte Verde down here. He says that he had found fire pits that he's dated with carbon dating to 33,000 years ago in Monte Verde, but he'll be the first one to tell you that there's probably some issues with that. But still, he's going with the 14.5 date, 14.8 date down there in Monte Verde. Um, Dennis Stanford from the um, Smithsonian Institute, he, he postulates that perhaps folks were coming over from Europe along the Atlantic coast. And then although the Atlantic coast ocean, the uh, Atlantic ocean currents go clockwise, he still thinks just as easy as folks made it across ice flows between Beringia and Alaska that they were able to come across across the Atlantic. And then the, the ocean currents to the south in the Southern Pacific, they 
travel counterclockwise. That's clockwise. This is counterclockwise. And so there are folks that are thinking that they came all over from Southeast Asia. They've, and as um, a, an explanation, they say that, and it's true that you can't see one island to the next over there in Southeast Asia, but people were able to make it down to Australia 50,000 years ago. And if they were brave enough to go over the horizon with no islands in sight, then it's very possible that they could have come up from the South over into South America. But the evidence of that is pretty weak. Now I'm showing you here a picture of the Southwest that everyone's probably familiar with. And we're over here just above Las Vegas. Okay. Over in White Sands, a uh, fellow named Matthew Bennett he saw in 2006 that there were some marks on the surface. They excavated down, oh, about a meter or two. And they, in 2009 and 2010, and they found this. And these, there, there's human footprints, there's sloth footprints. And then 2018, they found footprints from a young female with the, occasionally a toddler by her side as if she were carrying him or her for a distance and through seeds that are on the footprints and in the same level that were carbonated 21 to 23,000 years old in landlocked New Mexico, just blowing up the idea that the first humans came over here 13,000, 12,000, 15,000 years ago. So I'm telling you all of this to illustrate that dates are always changing. There are no definitive dates. So let's talk a little bit about the paleo folks. Archaeologists, like I said, debate exactly when the people arrived in America. But there is a consensus that by 13,000 years ago and earlier, there were groups of people that called the Great Basin home. And for folks that don't know it, this is a uh, an area of the Great Basin. And it's all, everything drains into this area. All the water drains into this area. It doesn't make it to the coast. The Colorado River comes out of the Grand Canyon and, whoop, let me go back. Let me do that. Colorado River drains out of the basin and uh, comes down and flows into the Gulf of Mexico there. I'm sure everybody knows that, but just to make sure, I guess. So the first recognized cultures were the Clovis and folks are identifying the Western stem tradition as well. And so there's talk of whether these are two different migrations because they seem to be two different uh, cultures that are, that are, uh, that made these tools. And that gives us a moment to talk about um, different cultures. How do I, how do we identify different cultures? Well, we identify them because they do similar things. In the case of the early peoples, all we have right now about the, are these toolkits that they left behind. They're similar, but different. So this leaves us with the possibility that there might have been more than one migration. In fact, as archaeologists and anthropologists talk about more than two migrations. And so uh, I'll just show you that uh, Teresa Riston and her crew found this in Lincoln County. This is the base of a Clovis Point. This one seems to be a chert, but they also found obsidian that we'll look at later that looks pretty similar. And they would, all Clovis points are gonna look the same and they're all over North America, uh, Central America, and even down into South America. And uh, the obsidian point that her and her crew found in Lincoln County came from Paradise Valley, which is up in northeast, uh, Western Nevada, close to the Oregon border, uh, 
the obsidian came out of there. Darren, and she also found some Western stem tradition points in her area of uh, survey. And then Darren Duke found a whole bunch of Western stem tradition points in Lincoln County. So what we're illustrating here is that the earliest recognized cultures were in Lincoln County. And now we wanna ask ourselves, well, they were using these on spears and why did they use such big points? Were the Paleo Indians hunting mammoths? Is this a scene from illustrated from the Paleo Indian times of those folks hunting down the big charismatic mammals that roamed the earth and they were here in Lincoln County? Um, I know of three different places that there were mammoth's bones found. Well, maybe, but recently, Mr. Aaron Metin et al. came up with the paper of the efficacy of Clovis fluted points for hunting probisiums. And he pointed out that Clovis points are assumed to be efficient weapons for tips, whip and tips for hunting probisiums, but experimental and archeological evidence cast doubt on this assumption. Clovis points are multifunctional tools, not specialized weapons for dispatching megafauna. Probisian hunting did not likely play a substantial role in the diet of Clovis groups or the Western stem tradition. Now that's not to say that they didn't eat them if they were trapped and could kill them um, or they scavenged them, uh, but hunting them probably not so often. Well, toward the end of the last age, ice age, uh, when the early immigrants probably maybe first entered into the area, the valleys of the Great Basin were full of lakes and the environment was much different from the landscapes we see today. The region was moister and cooler and evergreen trees covered the mountains, even reaching into the valley margins in some cases. Darren Duke describes it as a veritable grocery store for paleo folks. And it's areas that we only see uh, desert scrub today. The valley bottoms, the lakes are now dry lake beds that we can walk across. But they were often surrounded by lush marshland oasis that would have been home to all manner of animals and plants that were important resources for people coming into the area. Paleo Indians in the Great Basin may have encountered and even hunted those extinct large mammals, such as the mammoth, maybe, camel, ancient horse, the large forms of bison. They certainly hunted many birds and ant mammals that came to the lakes for the water and the food. And these first people probably traveled in small family groups. They walked long distances, carrying what they could and collecting and hunting when they needed, like food and clothing and bedding and a full few tools, medicines, and even water. The Paleo Indians would have carried nearly everything they needed with them and they would have kept moving to find the best places for food, water, and other raw materials that they needed as the seasons dictated. And part of their movements probably also had to do with keeping in touch with other people on the sparsely populated landscape. For thousands of years, since the beginning of time, they acquired food by fishing, hunting wild animals and collecting wild plants and berries and roots and seeds and greens and nuts. And these folks used tools made of stone, bone, shell, or wood. They wove baskets and later made pottery and built houses or in Lincoln County shelters, all from the natural materials they found around them. So this is the base of the Clovis Point. And I have to share an embarrassing story for you. Teresa Riston gave me GPS points for this Clovis point so I could collect it and send it to the, the Natural History Museum up in, um, in the Reno. And it's the base of the Clovis point and you can see it's fluted there. So it looks similar to the, to the Clovis point we were looking at earlier. This is the, the fluted area here and it's broken. And so she gave me the GPS point for it and it's out in the middle of nowhere, I can tell you. 
15 miles from a paved road. And uh, I went and with a partner of mine and we went looking around for it. And we were looking at the spot. We went a few meters this way, a few meters that way and looking for it and couldn't find it. So I'm checking my Garmin, my GPS unit to see if I am in the right place. And sure enough, I, I was in the right spot. And then my partner Sam said, hey, turn around and look down. So I turned around and looked down and there it was right in front of me, right behind me actually, but area that I had looked at already. Hard to see unless you know what you're looking for and are looking to pick it out even for a professional. So let's talk a little bit about the toolbox they used in the Great Basin. There were several kinds of tools that they used, I mentioned earlier, and uh, not the least of which uh, were their uh, lithic tools, lithic meaning uh, stone. It's the term that we use to describe to stone tools. And they were used for a lot of different things. As I was mentioning about the Clovis points that could have been used for knives, uh, cutting and uh, multifunctional tools. So they used different kinds of blades to cut things more, more formal like the Clovis point or the Western stem point that are very well made or more uh, uh, expeditious tools, just something that's sharp so they can make the cut. And they used spears to hunt with. They used addle addle darts. Here's a little uh, illustration of how an addle addle is used. I'm sure most folks are aware of it, but it's a pretty long spear here. And it's got a little uh, wedge on the back of it and it gives one leverage to throw it. And I've seen them on TV go a couple hundred yards and hit bullseyes. So if you're good with the, and I mean it a couple hundred yards, if you're good with those things and that's what you do all day is practice with it, you can get pretty good at it. And then finally, more or less uh, around 300 to 500 years AD uh, was the first use of the bow and arrow around these parts. We'll talk about a little bit more about that, but remember what I said about dates. We'll, um, they also used scrapers and they came in all sorts of different forms to scrape hides and, and scratch itches, I guess. And they also made drills out of different materials. And uh, another thing that they used were crescents. And this is a crescent that Teresa Riston found and uh, shared us a picture with it. And uh, we're not sure really what the crescents were used for. Maybe spear uh, shaft straighteners. Um, some other folks have done uh, DNA work on crescents and have found uh, waterfowl DNA on a few of them that they examined. So I'm just going to close this out for a second and we'll come back to it, get to see the PowerPoint again. But I wanted to show you this. Let's see if it's working. And there it is. So this is that crescent and this is a 3D representation of it that can be moved around so you can see both sides of it. And this is one of the projects that Teresa and her crew were working on to give us this 3D representation of, of this crescent. Kind of cool. Just thought I'd share that with you. So back to the PowerPoint. So they made all all kinds of tools out of out of rocks. Flint lamping is what it's called. So let's talk about the a little bit about the transmission of technology. So, you know, technology about how do you make things and how do you do things? What does your culture do? Well, we can relate to this a little bit about uh, how our cultural technology changes and the transmission of it. And most us older folks may might remember going from radio to TV or to color TV 
or how that worked around the neighborhood. You know, were you the first one to get a TV? Were you the first one to get a color TV? Or you could use pagers, a cell phone, smartphones, Android or iPhones, DOS to Windows 11 to Mac. And like this slide here, uh, or like the last slide about the 3D modeling, how do we illustrate things with petroglyphs or the Gutenberg press or Adobe or 3D modeling? The transmission of technology and life ways is fluid and it's messy. And how humans adapt is different for every neighborhood and every culture. And that's why it's hard to pin down dates. It's different for everyone, perhaps through generations, perhaps by thousands of years. We have relative dating to compare which came first and we have absolute dating to fine tune things, but they're not really absolutely absolute. But how do we fine tune things? Well, one way is by projectile point seriation. So this is a uh, older copy of a seriation from projectile points. And it works this way, is that in geology, there's this law of superposition. And what that is, is within a sequence of layers of sedimentary rock, the oldest layer is at the base and that the layers of, uh, are progressively younger with the ascending order and sequence. Kind of confusing, but generally speaking, without any outside influence, the deeper it is, the older it is. And so uh, detecting the age of the strata, usually by carbon-14 up until recently, relatively recently with luminescence dating, uh, that's how they determined the age of the strata, if they could find something that was uh, carbon datable. And then what uh, points are associated with that uh, strata? It's to similar projectile points at different locations. And then we get a, um, a spread of uh, how, how uh, time frame that they used a particular type of point. Here's another version of it. Different uh, places here, uh, different age groups with different projectile points. And another one here, same sort of thing, different places with different uh, ages and then comparing these over thousands of different excavations coming up with uh, a general idea of how they uh, uh, seriate projectile points. So also the Great Basin peoples from the paleo to the Great Basin peoples, they made rock art or rock writing no, we don't know exactly what they're communicating. We can only guess it's a dead language. There's no Rosetta Stone. Some folks say that means that, uh, um, that, that, that they know what it means, um, or this glyph means that, or, or the other thing, but uh, really it's only a guess, perhaps an educated guess. But your interpretation is as good as anybody else's. Remember that as I tell you what all these glyphs mean that we're gonna look at. So this panel is called the Amphitheater. It's in the White River Narrows in the Basin Range National, National Monument. And these things right here are thought to be addle addles. So that would mean that these came in before the bow and arrow. Here's uh, another, um, Petroglyph panel, I believe this is in Mount Irish, bunch of deer headed to the right. Here we have a PBA or pattern body anthropomorph. And that's these particular kinds are unique to the Paranagan value, uh, Valley. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Most of the times in all the petroglyphs that we've seen, about 70% of them, the animals are looking to the right. I don't know what that means, but yeah, there it is. Also another petroglyph in the area. This one's called electric deer. And this particular one, I, I don't know, deer in the headlights, deer in a bubble. Maybe it's a deer in a spaceship. I don't, I don't know. 
just so at some point folks made a transition transition to sedentism so what's what's sedentism well a nomadic group is one that moves from place to place hunting and fishing and gathering plant foods in different locations throughout the year a sedentary group is one that lives in the main village or a camp year round with only short or occasional visits to other areas. Farmers are sedentary because they need to stay close by to work in their fields. Well, at some point in some areas, folks begin to settle down, whether that's due to a reliance or an abundance of resources at an area or a constriction from other not so friendly folks that uh, maybe just, or maybe just to pool their resources with, with friendly folks. Around Lincoln County, the most influential of these first sedentary folks were the Fremonts. And to a lesser degree, there was uh, the presence of the Virgin Anastasi coming up from the Southeast. And I know everyone knows that the Virgin Anastasi are named after the Virgin River. So we'll let that go as it is. And so let's talk about the Fremont. So folks living along the edge of the Wasatch Plateau about 1,500 to 2,500 years ago began to cultivate maize. That's, an, of course, an early ancestor of corn and other plants. And it's likely that the maize seeds and the know-how to grow them came through trade with their neighbors to the south. Maize was grown in Mexico much earlier than it was already, and it was already an important crop to the people of south, southwestern United States by 3,000 to 4,000 years ago. And by 2,000 years ago, the people who lived in what we call Lincoln County also grew plants in the sandy soil along the rivers, including maize and perhaps beans and squash. Their maize wasn't exactly like our modern corn, but still an important food and being able to grow it themselves was a big advantage. And the Fremont were named after the Fremont River in Utah, where their camps were first discovered Fremont isn't a name of a tribe like Apache or Paiute or Shoshone. Fremont is the name of archaeologists have given to the mysterious group or groups of ancient people who lived about 1500 to 800 years ago in what we now, in now are states of Idaho, Nevada, and Utah, Wyoming, and Colorado. And we don't know how they were related to each other, but we know that they had many things in common. And so that, but again, a cultures folks who have things in common. The Fremont also use special large stones to grind their seeds for flour, manos and matares, or pestle and mortars. People now needed to be close to their friends to plant, to irrigate, to harvest their crops, and so they became more sedentary. And being in one place most of the time meant that they could build more substantial houses. They could dig special pits to store their food and supplies. And because they didn't have to carry all their belongings from camp to camp, they could accumulate more stuff. So this is an artist's conception of, the, of a Fremont village at Baker in White Pine County, some northeast of the Great Basin National Park. There's only, there, there's only one known pit house in Lincoln County. There may be others, but there's only been one that's been found. So the area of influence of the Fremont was pretty much Utah. It did kind of bleed over into Lincoln County. And we're mo more or less the hinterlands of the Fremont culture over here. Remember what I said about dates. So this is a, a, a timeline of the Fremont culture as it's interpreted today. And the Fremont are hard to define. One reason they seem to have changed the way that they lived according to the situation. They adapted. Sometimes they moved their homes from place to place following the seasonal ripening of important plants and migration of game animals. At, at other uh, times, they settled into well-watered places and cultivated intended plants like maize. They used uh, ceramics and alongside their uh, horticulture, the Fremont started making pottery. And before that, they probably used baskets for cooking and storing food. They had a unique style of pottery called grayware. And sometimes it has painted or textured designs. This pottery styles ties all the Fremont people together. And everywhere the Fremont lived, archaeologists, archaeologists find pieces 
of this great pottery. So they might have lived like this. How the Fremont lived depended on where they lived. This is especially true in the hinterlands of Lincoln County, along the rivers and the streams where there was water for irrigation, they grew crops. They lived in small villages with some of the other farming families, maybe in not so permanent shelters, away from the rivers in the drier regions, people relied more on hunting of animals, gathering the wild plants for their food. These hunter gatherers had to move around a lot going from hunting ground to hunting ground or from one patch of vegetation to the next. So these uh, unusual pilling features, they're named after Clarence Pilling who found many of them, were also made by the Fremont people. They have human shapes and are made from unbaked clay. They are small, flat figurines and are only four to six inches long. Some of them still have traces of their original yellow and black and red paint, which was made from the naturally colored clays and charcoal. And yes, there have been some found in Lincoln County. And not only do they have uh, these things that we've discussed, they made rock art. The Fremont made beautiful and unique rock art. Much of it is human-like figures with oddly shaped bodies and horn and feather headdresses. These large figurines carved into painted rock can also be found everywhere in the Fremont live. Some of them look as if they're wearing necklaces and earrings. Archaeologists have tried to relate the rock art in Lincoln County to the classic Fremont petroglyphs found in central Utah. Here's a, a few of them that we have around here. Some of you may recognize some of these, if not all of them. So the late archaic uh, cultural influence, uh, we talked about maybe getting influence, the Fremont being influenced from the South. Here's some other uh, um, cultures that existed uh, more or less contemporaneous with the, the Fremont. And they may have they may have developed the Puebloan culture, uh, sort of their country cousins. Uh, both groups had high quality grayware pottery. Both grew maize, beans, and squash, and both lived in pit houses. In fact, the Fremont may have learned pottery making and maize cultivation from the Puebloan neighbors. There, but there were also many differences between the two cultures. For one, many of the Puebloans were true farmers living in established villages, while the Fremont were probably only part-time horticulturalists who grew some of their food, but hunted and gathered the rest. And also the Fremont did not build anything like the grand stone architecture of Chaco Canyon or Mesa Verde or the cliff dwellings of Mesa Verde. And in Lincoln County, we have something that uh, is pretty unique. And here we have the Paranagate Man, Lincoln County's unique petroglyphs. They're only found within a few miles of the Paranagat Valley. And as far as we can tell, the oldest are in Black Canyon, uh, across from the Paranagat National Wildlife Re Refuge. Uh, there are several iterations of Paranagat Man. Here's a, here's a few of them. They all have the top knot. They have articulated fingers and feet. Um, they may have their eyes open or closed. There's hundreds of these in the Paranagat Valley. Valley. So then we have the Numix bread. After the um, Fremont, really there was multi-decadal occurrences of drought throughout the Southwest. And that brought a balkanization of all the cultures in the Southwest and really the Americas. But their bloodlines still exist, and it's mixed into the bloodlines of those who immigrated here. They didn't just disappear. They're, they, uh, I could say they, they're with the folks that immigrated here and everywhere else. The territories of these immigrants, as related by Isabel Kelly and Kate Fowler, who performed some of the anthropo anthropological research with the writings of early explorers and talking to the folks, they found the traditional territories of the Southern Pipes, including a broad swath of land covering Southern Nevada and Utah and extending Southwest following the contour of the Colorado River and into California. 
the Western Shoshone inhabited the, an area that extended from Death Valley on the west and northeastward across what is now central Nevada and into northwestern Utah. United by language and customs, these tribal bands across the area practiced a mobile life way that took advantage of the resources as they became available. And I'm sure most of you know, but there's a difference between prehistory and history. There might be two or three of you who don't know, so I'll tell you that the difference between prehistory and history is writing. And here in Lincoln County, that happened around 1840-ish. Dates again. Tribal organization was loose and territories were vaguely subdivided and inhabited by smaller bands. The bands were generally composed of smaller camps within the subdivided territory. Formal boundaries were unknown except for springs and some pine nut groves, which were considered private property and were passed down through familial ties. Relations between the groups were generally peaceful and members often hunted on and visited other territories freely. Some groups practiced small scale trade for items not common within their own territory. And so we see here some wiki ups. This is what uh, the Paiute Shoshone lived in this is a Paiute village here. Here's some Paiutes in front of a camera, so couldn't have been too long ago, but reminiscent of what they might have done before here, yeah, before European ancestry came along. Another, another wiki up sort of structure. This is, uh, uh, oh, but before I go into this, let me tell you that their diet varied uh, depending on the season and the abundance of resources. Many foraging territories were unable to provide sufficient food for the entire year and groups moved many times during their annual cycle. Large game was available to only some groups and some groups inhabiting areas where large ungulates were particularly scarce relied on small game, including various lizards and snakes and gophers and mice and rats and rabbits were commonly hunted both by individuals and in communal drives. Plant foods were mostly highly esteemed, were more highly esteemed than meat and included berries, roots and seeds and agave and nuts. And pine nuts were especially valued, although the crop could be spotty regionally and from year to year. To the south, the oven baked agave hearts provide a storable staple that could be gathered year round if the pine nut crops failed. So the ethno-historic, that's what the anthropologists call the time of the integration between those of European ancestry and native ancestry. Beginning in the early 19th century, Euro-Americans had established themselves on the southwestern landscape and near the traditional lands of the Southern Paiute. The presence of the Spanish colonies in New Mexico and Southern California began to negatively affect the native inhabitants. And archival research suggests that many Southern Paiutes were taken as slaves. An exodus of native peoples was apparent in the previously somewhat densely populated areas near the travel routes of the Euro-Americans. Here's a Paiute camp. This one of Esno Historic, just outside of a town. Here's China Bill and his wife Maud, their son Willie. It's from around 1913, a little ahead of where we're at at the moment, but he was a, a lucky guy who survived a, dare I say it, massacre over at Ash Springs and was raised by local Mormons who were not so adversarial to the to the Paiutes. Uh, the arrival of the Mormons created land management problems and many Southern Paiute were forced off traditional lands by Mormon settlers and farms. And then subsequently others that moved into the area. Additionally, the influx of other inhabitants in the region, particularly in response to mining booms, greatly depressed the availability of local food resources and in retaliation those natives remaining in the area organized raids and frequent skirmishes were reported the first two decades of contact. And in 1872, uh, an executive order was issued establishing the reservation of the Southern Paiutes of Utah, Arizona, California, and Nevada, and the Upper Muddy River within the Moapa Territory in Lincoln County. And there were some issues with that too, going back and forth from the size, but ultimately uh, they do have area there uh, near Moapa. Recently, Mark Giambastiani was uh, looking into ethnographic uh, studies and uh, areas of possibilities. This is not the one he found, but he did find one. Uh, actually, Kurt Braun found it and 
but didn't explore it. And Mark documented one and it probably looked very much just like this. Final, following the initial Mormon explorations in the 50s, the previous world of the native and Shoshone and Paiute peoples were rapidly transformed. The arrival and spread of Mormons and the miners in the mid 1860s started a wave of Euro-American settlement that would escalate dramatically for the next 10 or 15 years. Conflicts ensued as native people tried to hold on to their traditional substance, subsistence lands. But by the time the 1880s rolled around in most parts of Lincoln County, including the well-watered areas, had been appropriated by miners, farmers, and ranchers. Can't yep. 10 minutes state? here. All right, well, I'm gonna breeze through this quick and I'll try and be quicker. Can't overstate the importance of the Church of the Latter-day Saints to Lincoln County. The first permanent white settlers in what is now Lincoln County were Mormons. And in 1864, they established Panaka in the Meadow Valley. Euro-Americans, pioneers, and survive, surveyors had moved through the area early, but the Mormons made the first attempts to stay. Mormon land policy was largely driven by their experience in Missouri and Illinois, where conflict with non-Mormons resulted in persecution and then expulsion. And in the Great Basin, the intention was to occupy and control as much land as possible in order to create a buffer between them and their non-Mormon adversaries. The presence in what is now Lincoln County began in the early 1850s and several families exploring the areas, planting crops and determining locations for future settlement. Farming and ranching uh, played an important part in helping out the communities survive through the good time and the bad. And um, I can go on and elaborate on those things, but here's a homestead in Eagle Valley from uh, uh, I believe around the 1880s, um, there was a, um, a dam that was uh, built in the monument uh, called Anna City that they were trying to store water and uh, didn't work out. But the town was called Oneida. Elmer Davis was shot dead by Ernest DuPont. And it's a long story that I'm not going to get into now, but here lies... Elmer Davis in the Great Basin National Monument. Behind that is Water Gap. Um, Lincoln came along in uh, 18, uh, 80, uh, 1861, I believe, and uh, he was uh, a reason that Nevada became a state and was battle born. There was a lot of things going on, and now we're getting into the intertwining things that I was talking about earlier, but we'll move on and say that the uh, Nevada be, and the area to become Lincoln County became a state in 1884, battle born. And uh, what Nevada looked like uh, through the ages, through the years, changed pretty rapidly once it became a state. The boundaries changed, the counties changed until they came into their form uh, as they are now in 1909. Mining played a pretty important part in uh, Lincoln County and uh, and everyone rushed to Lincoln County to mine. That's We got uh, big mills that were built that are no longer there. Their foundations still exist, but they would pick up the whole thing and move them. There's one still in Pioch, a large one. Here's Logan City uh, over in Mount Irish and uh, what it looked when they were living there and what it looks like now and then here's a chimney from crescent city built in 1866 to 1870 to help uh, smelt the ores here's uh this one is delamar looking from the hills uh to the north west is looking over the mine and if you ever run out to, ever run out to delamar that's what it used to look like also, the railroad played a big part in Lincoln County. Uh, the tracks between uh, Front Street and the depot, there were a total of 18 of them, and now there's two. Here's the completion of the tracks in Caliente in 1905. Caliente, big railroad town. The depot still stands and is used by uh, uh, folks that rent out space owned by the city, and uh, the city offices are in there. Here's uh, the tracks as they are in front of the depot. And here's uh, to the left going through Rainbow Canyon and the 
train going through Condor Canyon. Civilian Conservation Corps played a big part uh, in the area from about, I want to say, uh, 1933 uh, till about 1942. They uh, had camps in uh, Panaca and in Dry Valley near Del Mew Ranch, and they referred to that as the POH camp, and there was a camp at Ash Springs. And uh, they came from all over the country, did tons of work in Lincoln County. This is uh, Panaka CC camp, CCC camp. This is an arch in the northern part of the Basin Range Natural Monument. And this is the same arch, the guardian of forever from Star Trek. I wanna say thank you to all the stewards and thank you for all of you for listening to me, uh, Babylon. So that's it for my presentation. I'm here to take questions. Yeah, so thank you for going through that, Harry. As somebody who's studied Lincoln County, there's so much um, to say um, in an hour is, is never enough time. So thank you for going through all that you did. Um, while you were presenting, a question popped up, and I thought it would be good to wait until you were done. Um, <laughs> Mar Marilyn asked, of all the time periods you presented, which one would you most like to live in or at least visit? I'd like to live in the one we live in uh, right now <laughs> or maybe a few years ago. Life was hard back then, very hard. And uh, they were strong, resilient people. And they didn't live quite as long as we do these days. So this is the time to be living. Visiting any one of them, they're fascinating. Just to stay for a few hours on the, uh, through the Guardian of Forever, that would be wonderful. But uh, what do we want? Time machines, when do, they, when do we want it? It's irrelevant. <laughs> All right, we got some kudos for your presentation, um, especially the picture of the railroad coming through Condor Canyon. Uh, does anybody else have any questions or comments that they would like to um, present? You can use the Q&A or the chat. I'm looking at both of them. Oh, thanks, I do, I do want to say um, that I think it was great. Thanks. A lot of the other presentations um, may have focused on a specific period of time um, when talking about research or are there different things, but to move it from, you know, the the movement, the first movement of people into the area to the CCC is, uh, it's pretty amazing to get that big picture because when our site stewards and other people are out there visiting um, all of those places, as you were saying, they kind of intersect. So you'll be finding mining type things next to petroglyphs, next to, um, you know, rock art, um, well, that's Patrick Lewis, but you know, all this stuff kind of is there together on the surface. So, all right, just a lot of kudos. I, I want to take a moment to say thank you to, to uh, all those folks that are uh, 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 um, liking my presentation. And, you know, Conchetta's up in Ely and, um, and high praise from uh, Elaine Holmes. I'm always scared to follow Kevin Rafferty. Can I tell you that? It's like the <laughs> Kevin Rafferty curse. <laughs> Apples See, and oranges. Back in the, yeah, well, back at the Three Corners conference, I followed Kevin and uh, my PDF, my uh, PowerPoint didn't work. So I was afraid that that might happen this time, but the muses are with us. Yes. Thank you, Jim Boone. Oh my goodness, look at that. Thank you, Steve. Yep, so some, some people who have dedicated a lot of their time, their free time um, and volunteer time to preserving the natural and cultural resources in Lincoln County. It's nice to see those folks on here as well. Absolutely. Yeah, and um, I think we're gonna leave with that, that um, everybody enjoyed it and I, I think it was a really great use. Uh, I believe that's Bob Claybaugh, um, who just said, thanks, Harry, great presentation. Um, Thank you, Bob. 
a great way to spend our, our Friday evenings. Learning a little well, thank bit you for more. inviting me. We had fun. Good. Thanks. And, and for everybody, um, I should have this up as a video presentation in the next week or so. Um, at the end, when you sign off, there's um, two questions. I'm trying to find a better way to send everybody the RS, the link to join the webinar and um, how you hear about it. Um, so if you could answer those two questions real quick, that helps me uh, do a better job serving you all. So awesome. Thank you. And everybody have, oh, here's some more coming in. Everybody who's logging Thank off, you. have a wonderful evening, a great weekend. If you're in Southern Nevada, stay cool. It's supposed to be in the 90s. Um, Saturday, so tomorrow, and, and the next day, I think it's supposed to be pretty hot. So get out early, bring lots of water. <laughs>